The reading is from the life and passion of the Holy Apostle and Evangelist Matthew, commemorated on the 16th day of the month of November. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. When he who is God and the only sinless Son of God who came in the likeness of man to save the sinful human race was leaving Capernaum, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his custom booth and said to him, Follow me. Hearing these words, not only with his bodily ears, but with those of his soul as well, the publican forsook everything and followed after Christ. Christ visited his home, and Matthew set a meal before the Lord. And Matthew's neighbors, friends, and many of his acquaintances, publicans and sinners, came to dine with Jesus and his disciples. Seeing that the Lord did not shun these people, but sat at table with them, the Pharisees and scribes said to his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Hearing this, Jesus answered, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Said Matthew, who was the brother of James, son of Alphaeus, became a disciple, an emulator of Christ, and was deemed worthy to be numbered among the twelve apostles. So that the honor of the apostolic rank might not suffer, the other evangelists referred to him not as Matthew, son of Alphaeus, but by his other name, Levi, as in Mark chapter 2, thus concealing his former occupation of publican, since he was known to be very few as Levi. Because of his great humility, however, St. Matthew in his own gospel speaks of himself using the name Matthew. Thus he acknowledges, as it were, his former sinful way of life before the whole world, and offers other sinners an example of humble repentance, assisting them to turn to the Lord and not be ashamed to confess their sins. It was St. Matthew who, after the descent of the Holy Spirit, was to write the first of the Gospels. He wrote his Gospel in the Hebrew tongue eight years after the Lord's ascension for those among the Jews who had come to believe. Here's a footnote. This is from the brief life of St. Matthew in the explanation of his gospel by St. Theophylact. Then he preached the gospel in various countries, notably Parthia and Media, and also traveled through Ethiopia, which had fallen to him by a lot, illumining that land with the light of the understanding of the Holy Gospel. Finally guided by the Holy Spirit, he went to a country inhabited by black savage cannibals, entering a city known as Mermena. There he gained a number of souls for the Lord. He appointed as their bishop Plato, his companion, and built a little church for them. Then he ascended a nearby mountain upon which he made his dwelling. He fasted and prayed fervently to God for the conversion of the unbelieving people, and the Lord appeared to him in the guise of a comely youth, holding in his right hand a staff. Christ bestowed his peace on the apostle, and then stretched out his arm to give him the staff, commanding St. Matthew to descend from the mountain and to plant the staff before the doors of the church he had built. This staff, said the Lord, shall take root, and be my power, and by my power grow into a lofty tree. The tree shall bring forth abundant fruit, surpassing all other fruits in beauty and sweetness. A spring of pure water shall flow forth from its root, and the appearance of the cannibals who drink the water shall be changed. They shall lay aside their savage ways, becoming meek and good. Taking the staff, Matthew came down from the mount and entered the city as commanded. On the way, the apostle was met by the wife and son of Fuvlian, the prince that ruled the city. They were tormented by demons and cried out with wild, threatening voices, Who was it that sent you here with that staff to destroy us? The saint rebuked the unclean spirits and expelled them, and the healed mother and son fell down before the apostle and humbly began to follow him. Bishop Plato learned of Matthew's coming, and taking his clergy went out to meet him. The saint went to the church and planted the staff, and straightway in the presence of all it grew into a lofty tree which spread forth leafy branches. Upon it appeared beautiful fruit, very large and delicious, and a spring of water flowed from its roots. 
Everyone who beheld this was filled with wonder. The entire city came to see the miracle, to partake of the sweet fruit and to drink the pure water. The Holy Apostle Matthew, standing on a high place, preached the word of God in the language of the people, and they immediately believed in the Lord and were baptized by the Apostle in the miraculous spring. First Matthew baptized the prince's wife and her son, who had been afflicted by evil spirits, then all the people who believed in Christ. Those who were baptized emerged from the waters comely and radiant, having put off the old man darkened by sin, and arrayed themselves in the new man which is in Christ. They were granted bodily cleansing and the purification and adornment of their souls as well. When the prince learned of the healing of his wife and son, he rejoiced at first, but then prompted by the devil became angry with the apostle, since the entire city was following him and forsaking the pagan gods. He decided to put the saint to death. That night the Savior appeared to the Apostle and commanded him to take courage, promising to remain with him during the tribulations to come. Morning found the Apostle with the faithful in the church chanting God's praises. The prince sent four warriors to seize Matthew, but when they reached the church darkness enveloped them and it was only with difficulty that they succeeded in returning to the prince. When asked why they had not brought back Matthew, they replied, We heard his voice when he spoke, but could neither see nor lay hold of him. The prince grew angrier and sent a whole company of warriors with orders to bring back the apostle by force and to slay anyone who attempted to prevent them from seizing him. When they drew near the church, a light from heaven shone upon the apostle, concealing him. Overcome by fear, they threw down their weapons and fled, returning to tell the prince what had happened. The prince fell into a mighty rage, and taking all of his servants, himself went to apprehend the apostle. But as he approached the church, he was suddenly struck blind and had to ask for someone to guide him. He begged the apostle to forgive him his sin and give light to his blinded eyes. The saint made the sign of the cross over the prince's eyes, restoring his sight. Although the prince could see once more with his bodily eyes, the eyes of his soul remained blinded by malice, and he attributed the miracle not to God's power, but to sorcery. Taking the apostle by the hand, he led him to his palace, as though to render him honor. In his heart, however, he planned to burn the apostle at the stake as a warlock. Perceiving his wicked intention, the apostle upbraided the prince, crying, Deceitful tyrant! When will you finally bring to pass what you have planned? Do what Satan has planted in your heart, for I am ready to endure all things for my God. The prince commanded his warriors to lay hold of St. Matthew and to stretch him upon the ground facing upward, his hands and feet pegged firmly to the earth. Then the persecutor had his servants bring a large quantity of branches and brushwood, pitch and brimstone, and after heaping all this on St. Matthew, they set it alight. The fire shot up, and everyone supposed that the apostle had been con consumed in the mighty flames when suddenly they grew cool and changed to dew. It could then be seen that St. Matthew was still alive and was chanting hymns to the glory of God. The people who witnessed these things and were amazed at the great miracle, praised the God of the Apostle. But the prince became even more obstinate, refusing to acknowledge that it was the might of God which had preserved the preacher of Christ unharmed by the fire. He called the righteous Matthew an iniquitous sorcerer, declaring it was by magic that he quenched the fire and survived the flames. Again, Fulvian commanded that wood, pitch, and sulfur be gathered and that when it had been placed upon the saint, naphtha be poured over it and lit. Twelve of the prince's golden idols were placed around the fire, and Fulvian called on them for help, asking that by their power Matthew be consumed by the flames. But the apostle prayed to the Lord of hosts as he lay in the fire, beseeching him to manifest his invincible power to reveal the impotence of the gods of the heathen, and to put to shame those who trust in them. Suddenly the flames leaped out towards the golden idols, sounding like a horrible clap of thunder. A fierce heat 
melted the idols like wax, and many of the unbelievers standing nearby were also burned. Then flame in the form of a serpent issued from the melted idols, melted idols and stretched itself towards the prince as though it meant to do him harm. Unable to escape the danger, threatening him, Fulvian at last cried out humbly to the apostle, beseeching deliverance. The apostle rebuked the fire, and it died down at once. The prince wished to make amends by honoring the holy apostle, but Matthew prayed and immediately surrendered his soul into the hands of the Lord. Orders were issued that a golden buyer be brought upon which was placed the precious body of the apostle, which was unharmed by the fire. The saint's corpse was clothed in costly garments, and Fulvian himself bore it to his palace, assisted by his nobles. After this, the prince commanded that an iron coffin be forged, and that the body of the holy apostle be placed in it. When this was done, the casket was sealed on all sides with lead and cast into the sea. Not yet possessing perfect faith, Fulvian said to his nobles, If he who kept Matthew whole, in the midst of the fire, preserves him also in the depths of the sea, then truly he alone is God. Him will we worship, forsaking all our gods who were powerless to save us from destruction by fire. That night, the saint appeared to Bishop Plato and said, Go tomorrow to the shore by the east side of the prince's palace, and there you shall find my remains washed up onto dry land. The following morning, the bishop went with a multitude of the faithful to the place indicated. There he found the casket. The prince was informed of this and came down to the shore, now believing without doubt in our Lord Jesus Christ. With a mighty voice he confessed as the one true God, him who preserved unharmed his servant Matthew, both while the saint was alive in the fire and in the deep after his repose. Falling down before the apostle's casket, he asked forgiveness for his offenses. He requested holy baptism, and Bishop Plato, perceiving that the prince had truly come to believe, agreed to his entreaties. After catechizing him thoroughly, Plato had the prince enter the waters of the font, and when he placed his hand upon the prince's head and was about to utter his name, a voice was suddenly heard from on high, which said, Do not call him Fulvian, but Matthew. Thus the prince received the apostle's name in baptism and sought to emulate the deeds of an apostle. He soon entrusted his principality to another, renouncing the vanity of this world. He devoted himself to prayer in God's church and was ordained a presbyter by the holy bishop Plato. Three years later the bishop proposed and the holy apostle Matthew appeared to him who was now prince instructing him to have Matthew, the presbyter, succeed the blessed Plato as a bishop. Matthew labored fervently in the hierarchical rank, proclaiming the gospel of Christ and turning many from idolatry unto God. After a long, God-pleasing life, he departed to the Lord. Now he stands with the holy evangelist Matthew before the throne of God and prays for us that we also may become heirs of God's eternal kingdom. Amen the prayers of our holy apostle and evangelist Matthew, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen.